church, how are you? Give God one more big shout of praise. You can be seated. So this morning is a little bit different than usual. Uh, We are not going to give you like five points in an outline. In fact, uh, we're studying through John 19, but we're only going to give you some verses in John 19, and I'm just going to kind of read through the text, and I'm going to make some observations, and we're just going to focus on the cross. Everybody say focus on the cross. So uh, the most powerful chapters in the Bible from my perspective would be John 19, and the chapters in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are about the cross, because all of our salvation, all of our freedom, all of our blessing, all of the good stuff that we experience is directly tied to this cross. And I know uh, the world doesn't really understand why, why this even is a big deal. In fact, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, and it's kind of where I want to start. I'm going to start with one verse, and then we'll jump to John chapter 19, and it just says this. It says, the message of the cross is what? We'll start over. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. In other words, the people out there in the world, they got no idea why this cross matters. But to us who are being saved, it is the what? It is the power of God. Like this cross is the reason why you could be favored by God, blessed by God, forgiven by God. It's the reason why you have relationship with God. If it wasn't for a cross, you would have no possibility of any relationship with God ever. In fact, the only thing you were destined to do without the cross is hell. Sometimes people say, I wish people would get what they deserve. You do not want people to get what they deserve. If you got what you deserved, you'd go to hell. Think about the scriptures for a second. We are sinners destined for punishment. And if it wasn't for somebody else who took our hell, we would all go there. You don't get what you deserve because of the cross. In fact, I'll give you a simple little illustration. Uh, This is probably the easiest way to understand why the cross matters. Uh, Us and God, and there is a great gulf between the two of us, and no matter how hard you try to earn your way to heaven or get back in relationship with God, you cannot without the cross. This cross is a giant bridge, and if there was no cross and no death and no hellish execution of Jesus, you could never be favored, never be forgiven, never be blessed, never have hope, never have relationship with God. Your prayers could never be answered. If there was no cross, you would have no hope. But because there is a cross, this bridge says, if you trust Christ, you walk over here into eternal blessing. Ephesians 1 said you have all the blessings you have, all the blessings of heaven are yours in Christ. This bridge says that when you trust Christ, you walk into relationship with God and he is always with you. This bridge says that no matter what you face, you are always favored. That no matter what you do, you are always forgiven. That no matter what you do, you are always righteous. That no matter what you face, you always have someone in your corner. And this cross is the bridge to every blessing that you could ever experience. If there was no cross, we would have nothing. With the cross, we have everything. Can I get an amen? This is why the chapter we're studying is the most important chapter in this whole context in the life of Jesus, if he was just a good teacher, if he was just a good dude that did some miracles, you would still be on your way to hell and so would I. But because of this chapter, everything in heaven is opened to us. So I'm gonna pray and then we're just gonna walk you through the last 24 hours or the last few hours in the life of Christ, uh, specifically his crucifixion, Lord Jesus, I pray that as we study through this text in John 19 today, that people would grasp the gravity of this chapter, that they would would understand what you did and the power that was given to us and the blessings that were given to us and the favor that fell on us because of this event. The world changed when you took our punishment. May we understand this and may we give you glory. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me with your word. Lead me now, Jesus. And all God's people said. So this is how John 19 starts. We're just going to read some text, some of the verses in it. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip is how the NLT translates it. Um, this, is, this whip was actually called the cat of nine tails. I'm going to show you a picture of it. Uh, it wasn't just a lead-tipped whip. It had uh, bits of... Uh, steel or bits of, 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 of iron, bits of uh, glass, 
little chunks of lead, uh, little bits of nail on nine straps. And then these straps would be used to then beat Christ. Uh, if you were a Roman citizen, they could only beat you 39 times with it for punishment because they were trying to be good to you because you were a Roman citizen. Imagine being hit with that 39 times. Uh, but Jesus was Jewish, so they could hit him as many times as they wanted. Uh, so uh, what would happen is there'd be a post about this high, they would attach your wrists to it, your feet would be spread apart, and then two guys with two of these whips with nine lashes each would take them and it wouldn't just hit the back. Uh, they're hitting wherever, man. Back of the neck, side of the face, uh, across the stomach as it wraps around, the legs, the buttocks. Um, and that whip would come across and it would, let's say it hit here, it would hit here and then they would, they would just be farmers for a second, man. They're just plowing a field. And they would tear through human flesh so bad that Roman historians wrote that hardly anybody ever survived the whipping post because many times their organs fell out before the beating was done. Now, why would Jesus do this? Why would he allow himself to go through this? We talked last week about he had all the power of the crucifixion, like he was in control. Why would he do it? And it's super simple because 500 years prior, the prophet Isaiah wrote this. This is Isaiah 53, verse 5. He said, by his stripes, we are what? Healed. healed. So your healing came through his beating. He recognized, if I would get beaten for them, my stripes could cause them to be able to pray for healing, and God would answer prayer. Healing physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So that when you got to go to God and say, God, will you answer my prayer? I need healing for this. He goes, yes, my son took the punishment so that you could be healed. And if there had not been a beating, you could not experience healing. So this had to happen. This is prophesied 500 years before it ever happens. And then the next text, the next just part of this verse is the soldiers then wove a crown of thorns, everybody say crown of thorns, and put it on his head. And uh, one of the years I was in Israel, somebody gave me a crown of thorns, Israeli crown of thorns. Uh, but once again, I want you to understand that Jesus had to wear this in order to be your savior. W what do you mean? So 2,000 years prior, there's another story, maybe you heard of it. Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac on an altar. So God came to Abraham and said, I want you to sacrifice your one and only son like, Jesus, like God was gonna sacrifice his one and only son. And I want you to take him to the top of a mountain. And there I want you to sacrifice him. And so Abraham took his one, one son, Isaac, to the top of the mountain. He laid him down on an altar made of, and the top of it was made of wood, like the cross was made of wood. He grabs the knife. He's about to kill his only son. He doesn't know how God's going to resurrect him, but he believes God's got a plan. And he goes to, he goes to kill his only son. And God goes, no, no, I don't want you to kill, us, kill your son. Instead, I have a substitute. And this is what Genesis chapter 22, verse 13 says. It says, Abraham looked, and there in a thicket, or a th thorn bush, he saw a ram caught by its head. And he looked over and he took the ram and he sacrifices a bird offering instead of the Lord. Do you know what's crazy about that, that story? It's happening in the same spot where Jesus is now being crucified. It's the same mountain, it's the same spot. 2,000 years later, God takes his son to the top of the mountain and the wood is offered and the son is caught by his head in thorns and he becomes the sacrifice for you and for me. He is the substitute so that we would never have to experience hell. He took your place and substitution as the lamb caught by its head in thorns. See, this is, this little piece, not an accident. It's 2,000 years in the making. It's the same story in the same spot. We'll go back to the reading. You can back up to that previous verse. And they put, the, uh, put a, robe, a purple robe on him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they mocked as they slapped him across the face. And Pilate went out again and said to the outside again to the people and said, I, I, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him, what are the next two words? 
Come on, talk to me. Not guilty. So this is just a reference to the fact that Jesus never sinned in word or in deed or even in thought. He never made one mistake. He never thought one nasty thought. He wasn't just a good dude sometimes. He was perfect. He never, ever made one error in 33 years of life. He elevated himself to perfection. If he had not been perfect, he could not die for you. Only somebody perfect could take the sins of the world and sacrifice himself. If he was just average and he still committed sins, everyday people die all the time and they can't take your punishment because they're just average. But he was extraordinary. The perfect one took the sins of the world at the cross. This is why he could be your substitute, because he was perfect and you and I are not. And then we'll keep reading. Then Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And once again, I would just stop to say this. So uh, they put that purple robe on him to mock him. So they put the crown of thorns on his head and the robe on him and they're mocking him as the king of the Jews. And, uh, but they're also doing it as atrocity because when they put that robe on him after his back is beaten so bad, I mean, he's got nothing, no, no skin pretty much left. Um, one place in scripture says he didn't even look human by this point. And he hasn't even got to the cross yet. They put this purple robe on him and it's like a giant bandage and it's gonna suck up all the blood and it's gonna clot there for a few minutes and then out of just, see, just sheer meanness, they just rip it off like a bandage and pull what remaining left of skin was on his back off. One place in scripture says you could count his ribs And so he's standing there in this crown of thorns and purple robe, and Pilate said, look, here's the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him, take him yourself and crucify him. Pilate said, I, I, I find him not guilty. Once again, he said, hey, this guy's never done anything wrong. What are we doing here? But then Pilate turned him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. And once again, I'll stop and say the cross probably weighed about 125 pounds. This is a man who's now been beaten, who's surely going to die just from blood loss. And he's got to carry a 125-pound cross 750 yards uphill. He's going to go down one hill and then up another. Uh, in another one of the Gospels, it says that he could not make it. One of the places says he probably fell, like legend says he falls seven times in this journey, and then eventually he cannot He's exhausted, he just, he cannot carry the cross and so somebody helps him get it the rest of the way there. He then went to the place called the skull or in Hebrew is Golgotha, everybody say Golgotha. And there they nailed him to the cross. I'm gonna give you an image of Golgotha because we know where Christ's body hung on the cross. It was in front of this cliff or on top of this cliff. We don't know if it was in front of or on top of, it just says it was the place of the skull. Notice the skull in the side of this cliff. Eye, eye, nose, wicked little mouth. And this is the place where the Romans killed criminals. It was also, there was a road right here that just passed by on the way to Jerusalem. So he was either killed in front of this on this cross or he was killed on top of it so that everybody walking past could notice him in his pain and misery and shame. Now, the way that crucifixion works, the Romans had perfected it. They could not actually nail someone through the hand because if they did, the human body weight would pull it out. And scripture says not a bone of his body would be broken. So they couldn't put a nail through his hand because it would have, break, it would have broken the bones in his hand. So instead they put the nail right here through the, through the wrist. You can feel the spot between your wrist bone where there's space enough to fit a nail. And the human body can hold that weight in that spot. Uh, in, in Hebrew, the word for wrist and the word for hand is the same word. So there's not a separation. That's why it says he was nailed through the hands. Like the, that, that's the same word so that they don't see a distinction between wrist and hand. So a large spike goes through this hand. A large one goes through this wrist. Then his feet are crossed. And one spike is driven through both feet. 
in just the right spot so that once again, it does not break a single bone. They've perfected this. They've been running this, this scheme with prisoners for, at this point, about 700 years, so they know how crucifixion works and how, or how, to, and how to kill someone this way. And um, So once somebody is set on a cross, uh, the way you die on a cross is asphyxiation. So you just stop being able to breathe because here's how this works. The only way you can catch a breath is to push up on the nail in your feet and you push yourself up. <gasps> So you can get a breath and then you're so exhausted you let yourself back down. And so Roman historians talk about men and women writhing on crosses for days if they would give them water. And so Christ on this cross, crucified, hangs there for six hours, up and down, writhing on this wooden cross. Now I'm telling you about the physical pain because I just want you to understand Sometimes people are like, I don't believe in hell. What are you smoking? If there's no hell and Jesus had to go through that, God's a jerk. If there's no such thing as hell and Jesus had to do all of this to rescue us, man, God must be the, it doesn't even make any sense. See, this cross is evidence there's really a hell and people are really gonna go there if they don't trust in the finished work of what Jesus did. He took your hell so you would never have to face it. Man, people just don't grasp the significance of this cross. Now, to be fair, I don't even think the worst punishment of the cross had anything to do with the physical pain. The worst punishment was a perfect person suddenly covered with the vilest sins of the entire world at once. Imagine you've never experienced the shame of lying or gossip or pride. You've never had a moment where you've ever done anything evil or sinful or sickening or wrong. And then suddenly at the cross, you become all the evil of the entire world. It all falls on you at once. Total perfection now covered in the worst evil, the sin of pedophilia, the sin of racism, every murderer and serial killer and violent act and rapist and pride and gossip and sinful, sick, nasty thing any human being has ever committed. The perfect one becomes ultimate sin at the cross, which is why the sky goes dark and, one, and Matthew says, and, and God turns his back on the sun and Jesus shouts, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The worst pain is not the pain of the physical, it is the pain of the spiritual and being covered in every sin ever committed for all of humanity past, present, and future on the perfect one. See, this is the power of the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. And when the soldiers had crucified him, they divided his clothes among the four of them and they took his robe, but it was seamless and woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, rather than us tearing this apart, let us throw dice for it. And once again, this is fulfilling a scripture from several hundred years before. They divided my garments among themselves and they threw dice for my clothing. So even the fact that they're at the base of the cross playing dice to figure out who gets Jesus' robes is a prophecy fulfilled at that moment that had been predicted several hundred years in advance. It wasn't an accident. They're, they're throwing dice for his clothes. So that's what they did. And standing near the cross was Jesus' mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Um, John is writing this, so John is there too. So John is the only man, the only male friend in Jesus' life that stays with him till the end. The others are gone. The only th other people at the cross are, that, that love him are three women. Which is just a reminder, ladies, if they can stick it out and walk by faith, so can you. So can you. They showed more strength at the cross than the men ever did. Then Jesus saw his mother standing there besides the disciple he loved and he said to her, dear woman, here's your son. And he said to the disciple, here's your mother. 
And from then on, this disciple went, went, took, took her into his home. And I just want you to have this image in your head. Jesus is trying to get a breath. And he comes up for air. And he looks down and he sees, he sees his mom. And he's like, Mom, John's now your son. John, she's now your mom. I need, I need you to take care of them. And notice at the cross, he's not whining about his own pain. He's trying to make sure his family is taken care of. That's powerful, man. See, in Christ, we, are all, we all become brothers and sisters. We all become connected. We all become unified. That, that, that everywhere, every other person in this room is a mother or father or sister or a brother to you. That you are never alone. That you always have family. The cross, one of the blessings of it is the church gives you a family where you have someplace to never be alone. See, even at the cross, he's could be focused on his pain, but instead he's focusing on making sure his people are blessed. Jesus then knew that his mission was now finished. Guys, just so you know, yours is not. Look at the person next to me, your mission is not finished. Your mission is not finished. Just Jesus was over. Yours got a long way to go, guys. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. Now, why would it matter that he says, I am thirsty, and I would just throw this out there, because he's identifying with the fact that he was human. He wasn't going through all this in some sort of Jesus state in which it was just fine. He experienced the pain of humanity. He experienced what it mean to thirst. He knew what it was to hurt. He knew what it meant to be confused and lonely. God is not a God who does not understand human pain, but God came so close that he experienced human pain out of love for you and for me. So when you pray to him, he's not like some God in the sky who doesn't understand. He has been through it. He knows what it means to feel loss and pain and shame. He knows what it means to hurt and to go through stuff, he gets it. And so he goes through it so that he could experience what it's like to be like you, so that he could love you more and empathize with your struggles. Not far away and distant, but close. Having decided that he himself should not just rule the universe, but he should be like you, so he could understand you. A jar, a jar of sour wine was sitting there, and so they soaked a sponge in it and put it on a hyssop branch and held it up to his lips. And when Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is what? It is what? It is finished. Now, in, uh, in Greek, it's the word tetelestai. Everybody say tetelestai. And it literally just means this, paid in full. It's the last thing Jesus ever says at the cross. He just shouts, paid in full! Now, what's amazing about Tetelestai is when you would write up a bill of sale and somebody would pay a, a bill to buy something from you or you were to buy something from somebody else, you write at the bottom of it, instead of signing your name like a credit card, you would write Tetelestai. Slide it back across. And what Jesus was shouting to the world was, all sin for all time, paid in full. I have done it. There's no sin that ever needs to be paid for. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't be good enough to get your way to heaven. You can't deserve heaven. He did the work so that you could just have heaven freely. It is a free gift paid in full. This is why we celebrate the cross. This is why this is the greatest moment in all of human history. Because when he paid the price for our sin, forgiveness fell on you and favor fell on you, and love fell on you. And no matter what you do, favor's always on you. No matter what you do, no matter what, what you don't do, no matter how you act or don't act, what, at the, somebody's like, but what if I sin tomorrow? What if I fin sin next week? All your sins were in the future to Jesus. You live 2,000 years later. He knows everything you're gonna do next week and two weeks from now and two months from now and two years from now and 10 years from now. And when he died, he took all of those sins at the cross even though you haven't even committed them yet. And in that moment, when he paid for all of my sins, God was able to look at me 
and declare me righteous. To see me as not a sinner, but a saint. To see my future as good and I'm blessable and I can have the favor of God. And when I pray, God can answer my prayer. And it's simply because of what Jesus did, not what I do. You cannot get God's favor with your works. You get it through the blood of Christ and he freely gives it to you out of love. See, this is the greatest moment in all of human history. I want you to think about your life. Are you trying to earn God's love? Are you trying to earn God's favor? You're trying to, like, if I could just be good enough, God would be proud of me. Man, God was proud of Jesus, so he's proud of you. So you gotta get what the cross means. That in the end, you're loved and there's nothing you can do about it. In the end, you're favored and there's nothing you can do about it. You're blessed and there's nothing you can do about it. He sees you as righteous and holy and as good. Because of Jesus, you have all the blessings of heaven. And they can't be taken from you. They can't disappear. They can't be gone. Otherwise, if they could be taken, then his work wasn't enough. It was either enough or it wasn't. You have to trust that your works don't get you anything, but his works get you everything. Are you hearing me, church? Imagine living your life knowing that you were already favored and already blessed and already loved, deeply loved, highly favored, greatly best, totally righteous, destined to reign. That's why we say this stuff. It's because of the cross and nobody can ever take this stuff from you. It is the devil that whisper in your ear, you're, you're, you're covered in shame and you're covered in guilt and you don't matter and you don't count. It's the devil that lies to you and tells you that you weren't given these gifts at the cross and that you have to earn something from God. You don't have to earn anything. You have been blessed and there's nothing the devil can do about it. So don't listen to him anymore. Are you hearing me? John three sixteen, the most famous verse in scripture. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not what? It's impossible for you to per perish in Christ. You cannot lose what God gave you at the cross. But you have eternal life, and eternal life means both now and forevermore. It doesn't mean just someday I get heaven, but it means from the moment you decide to trust Jesus for heaven, you get all the blessings of heaven now till forever. It's not, it's not a someday blessing, it's a now blessing till forever. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life or unending life, and it happens when you believe. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God's not mad at you but to save the world through him. Jesus paid it all so the blessings of heaven could fall on you. And this is why we are Christian and why this is the most powerful chapter in the book of John. Everything rides and falls on the cross. I'm just gonna invite you to close your eyes and bow your head for a second. I want you to think through your life and what you're trusting in. Are you trusting in what Jesus did or are you trying to earn God's favor? It'll never be good enough, but you could trust what Jesus did is enough. In fact, I'm just gonna lead us in a simple little prayer and I'm gonna invite you to, to pray it out with me, just out loud, just say, Jesus Christ, thank you for your work at the cross. I can't earn my way to heaven. I can't earn my favor. You freely give it to me because of Jesus. Thank you for your love for me. I choose to believe in you. I make you my savior and God. Bless me with all the benefits of heaven. I choose to walk in relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.